Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 178, cover dated February 1984. The cover here is by John Romita Jr., inked by Dan Green. So this is the first collaboration between the pair on Uncanny X-Men. We'll have to wait for the next issue for Dan Green to ink John Romita Jr. on the interior pages. So this cover, it's interesting. It presents the X-Men fighting the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, three of them anyway, plus Amanda Sefton here, helping Nightcrawler against Avalanche. I like this down shot of Wolverine uh, striking towards the blob and then Pyro taking on Storm here. But there's something a little off with the perspective on Nightcrawler versus Avalanche here. He's up too high, his head is too big if he's throwing a punch at him. Um, it's a double uh, attack on Avalanche with Nightcrawler and Amanda teaming up against him there. And I'm not quite sure what I make of the green color background. One last thing to note before opening up the comic to the interior, and that is that Cyclops is still there uh, listed as one of the X-Men despite being off on honeymoon uh, with Madeline Pryor. So the splash page here picks up from the end of the previous issue. Colossus was superheated by Pyro and then Avalanche used his powers such that four trucks of, nitri of liquid nitrogen were poured over Colossus and it looks as though he's dead. Kitty's uh, fearful of that and we'll see what happens in the course of the issue. So the title of the story is Hell Hath No Fury. The quotation is from Shakespeare and the full quote is Hell Hath No Fury Like a Woman Scorned. So we'll find out in the story inside who the woman scorned is. The creative credits are Chris Claremont Ryder, John Romita Jr. Penciler, Bob Wyacek and Brett Breeding, Inkers, Glynis Swine, Colorist and Tom Orzakowski, Letterer. So let's see what happens next. So Kitty decides to pull herself together and uh, she uh, makes a mental call to Professor X. So then we move to the X-Mansion, Professor X reading a letter here by the Fire Rogue, listening to some music on her headphones. And this is a, this is a bit amusing. So Professor X has gotten a letter from Scott Summers from his honeymoon. And just look at this picture. So it's Scott and Madeline naked in bed with a big love heart pillow behind them. And Scott looking pretty pleased with himself. Um, what's going on? Why would he send such a picture to his uh, former headmaster, come a uh, substitute father figure. It's a bit strange. Uh, but in any case, Professor X gets the message from Kitty and he senses her distress and then she informs him here. I like this trope of we see Kitty's eyes and then blending into Professor X's uh, profile. And she says, we've been ambushed, sir. I think by the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, Colossus has been terribly hurt. They didn't bother with me, but Nightcrawler's at Lincoln Center. They're probably going after him. So Professor X um, mind links with Storm and Wolverine who are training in the danger room. And he does this surreptitiously because he doesn't want Rogue to know that something's going on with the Brotherhood. He thinks here to himself, I mustn't let Rogue see anything is amiss. She used to belong to the Brotherhood. She joined the X-Men in uh, issue 171, so fairly recently. Indeed, she considers their leader, Mystique, her mother. So 30 meters below the mansion in the danger room, we've got Wolverine and Storm working out. We've got Wolverine standing over a uh, case of brewskis here. And um, Storm is flying around the room. And I guess the exercise is that Wolverine remove her cape, which he does. And then this is something I've been talking about in recent videos because I've been reviewing Weapon X and also Wolverine 75. And the question was, is it a retcon that Wolverine uh, turned out to have bone claws? Well, if we look at the omniscient third person narration here, we learn that Wolverine's claws are forged of the pure metal that is adamantium. They can cut through anything. So the bone claws are then a retcon, it turns out. And so here we have Aroro congratulating Logan on, um, removing the cape, slashing the cape from her body without touching her. Piece of cake, he says. Oh, really? Next time I'll fly faster. So I really like this panel here of Wolverine lighting his uh, cigarette. And uh, it seems to me to be influenced by a little bit of uh, Frank Miller influence there on John Romita Jr. 
and um, Wolverine says to Aurora, a lady could get hurt that way. The risk is what makes it fun. And Wolverine responds, that's Yukio's line, usually when she's playing chicken with a 200 mile an hour bullet train. One could have worse role models, Logan, says Aurora, who spent some time with Yukio in issues 172 and 73 of the title. And then Professor X interrupts X-Men We've an Emergency. And so they get the uh, deal regarding going to Lincoln Center. And I like that this, this, this panel is funny here where Storm has Wolverine picked up and she's holding him in her arms and kind of like a gender role reversal here. And Wolverine with his hands folded, he looks pretty fed up at the situation. He's just going along with it because he needs to get to Lincoln Center and he isn't going to be taking the bus. So uh, Storm, who's team leader, asks uh, Professor X, what about Rogue? Has she been alerted? And then uh, Professor X explains he believes that she's best let it, left out of it. A battle with those who were until recently her teammates and friends might put her loyalties to an unendurable test. And Storm concurs. And then Professor X is hit by a bolt of sonic force, smashing through his natural defenses like they didn't exist. And he thinks to himself here, it wasn't an attack. It was more like a scanning wave. Now what this turns out to be is seeding for Secret Wars, the upcoming Secret Wars miniseries, limited series, and crossover through various Marvel titles. It will turn out to have been the Beyonder who was sonically scanning Professor X and other major figures in the Marvel Universe. So Rogue volunteers to get Professor X some uh, aspirin. He uh, kind of uh, says to her disingenuously that it was a migraine. And then we switch back to Lincoln Center and to Kitty who pulls herself together. And she remembers that Reed Richards has a portable high intensity heat source. He designed to thaw organic matter without causing any harm. That could be precisely what Colossus needs. So she races to a public phone and she gets the FF's android or robot secretary on the line, Roberta. And uh, she informs Kitty that the Fantastic Four are currently not in residence. And then we have an editorial note from Louise Simonson here to learn where they are and what's happened to them. Check out the latest issue of their own mag. So in issue 262, it's the trial of Reed Richards who's on trial uh, for having saved the life of Galactus. So they're off planet continuity wise. So Kitty hails um, a cab, I like the perspective on this yellow cab here, uh, to take her to the Baxter building, which is where the FF reside at this point in history, before Four Freedoms Plaza. And then the scene switches here to a back alley on the Lower East Side. A body lies cold and still. She had a name, but no one will ever know it. Family too, though she fled them years ago, seeking a better life in the Big Apple. The gauntness of her features, the needle tracks on her arms, are mute testaments to the way she lived and died. So this is pretty grim stuff for, you know, what is ostensibly still uh, a children's comic, you know. Um, but who's here looking at the body except for Callisto, Mask and Sunder of the Morlocks? And Callisto has a plan for this dead woman and Mask begins to use his flesh molding powers on the body. It is a corpse. And what's all that about? Well, we'll have to continue reading, of course, to find out. Then we switch back to Lincoln Center. This reminds me in the previous issue <clears throat> and this issue, the rendition of Lincoln Center is accurate. And that's because, you know, John Romita Jr. Um, was uh, and is um, a resident of New York City, specifically Brooklyn, but he would go into the city and sketch the places that scripts called uh, on him to draw. So that's why we get an accurate rendition of some of these locations in New York City that Claremont wants Romita Jr. to draw, and he does a really good job of it. Um, so we've got Nightcrawler and Amanda Sefton canoodling here, and then they're worried about, well, Nightcrawler's worried about why Kitty and Peter uh, Colossus are so late when they are interrupted by a fire dragon and of course that's Pyro behind that so Nightcrawler teleports up to the roof with Amanda but who's waiting for them except for Avalanche of the um, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants and don't forget as well one of the key members of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants is Destiny and her role 
is to communicate to the team members, the Brotherhood members, uh, what the X-Men, what their foes are going to do. So she will have predicted that Nightcrawler would teleport up to the roof and that's why Avalanche is up there waiting for them. So he teleports away and he has a telepathic contact from the Professor who tells Nightcrawler you're in imminent danger of attack. Um, and then it's too late of course because someone calls Nightcrawler here, heads up. Uh, well, it was Amanda, it's the Firebird again, but she uses um, a protection spell, a defense spell against the Fire End Elemental, and that protects them. And I love this panel here with the Tom Orzakowski sound effect of Blob landing uh, on the ground and uh, the shockwave uh, tumbling uh, Amanda and Nightcrawler off their feet. And here the Blob grabs Amanda and then he also manages to grab uh, Nightcrawler. He says, you pop your fuzzy blue carcass back here on a double or I'll snap your skirt's pretty little neck. The blob really does have a way with words. So Nightcrawler ports back and now the blob has both of them by the throat. And is he gonna crack their necks? No, because he is blasted from behind a lightning bolt by Storm, who's arrived just in the nick of time with Wolverine. I really like this shot of the two of them. And I like the way that Ramita Jr. has Storm wearing her cape. It's, da it's slash damaged from earlier in the danger room. So we've got that bit of continuity running through the issue, but it looks well with the uh, leathers that she's taken to wearing since uh, Tokyo, since the team's um, adventure in Japan. Um, and then we have Destiny here uh, uh, helping Nightcrawler from being murdered by the, uh, the Brotherhood. She thinks here Nightcrawler is safe for the present. I do not think Mystique will fault me for that. And that's interesting because a little kind of hint in the previous issue was that there might be a parental relationship between Mystique and Nightcrawler. So we're getting further development of that in this particular issue. And it confuses uh, the Blob and Pyro and Avalanche who wonder whether Destiny is entirely on their side or not. And then the scene switches to the Baxter building. Kitty leaves the cab to, she phases out of the cab to uh, enter the Baxter building. And uh, she sees the robot secretary here, phases through the robot secretary which of course Kitty's power is if she phases through any electronic equipment, she shorts it out. So then she phases her way up through various levels of the Baxter building. And she says that uh, the lab is on the third level. So that's where she expects to find the gizmo that might be helpful for Colossus. But I've got to be real careful how I go. She thinks the last thing I can afford is to unintentionally crash some ultra important device or experiment. Meanwhile, the robot secretary recovers, um, but has a temporary uh, memory uh, block and recognizes that there's an intruder at large within the facility, identity unknown, abilities predominantly unknown, intent unknown, presumed hostile, initiating stage one security alert. Okay, so Kitty's gonna have some security on her tail as she tries to get that gizmo out of Reed Richards' lab. And then we switch back to Lincoln Plaza and the developing battle between the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. I really like this color hold here of Destiny, um, uh, communicating to the Brotherhood the moves that the X-Men will make and the narrative caption here says, Destiny does her best to anticipate the X-Men's moves. Unfortunately, it's one thing to warn a teammate that Nightcrawler is about to teleport away from his punch and something else again for him to react fast and effectively enough to do anything about it. So Destiny's power is formidable, but hampered by the uh, swiftness of the X-Men's skilled maneuvers and actions. And here Wolverine bounces off the blob. So we see him running towards the blob, blades out, and then bouncing right off the blob's belly. And then Storm being attacked by Pyro here, and uh, she uh, really lives up to her name, sending a monsoon raining so hard that Pyro can hardly stand. And then we switch back to Kitty in the Baxter building. She finds the gizmo that she's been looking for, and then she makes her way to the roof, and she's got a plan where 
she'll apologize to Reed Richards in the future and she'll make amends by babysitting for Reed. But then she gets ready to phase walk on air to a building across the street. And she thinks to herself, if my concentration is broken while I'm phasing, I'll fall. If I stay where I am, I'll get captured, which won't do any, anyone any good. So she tells herself to relax, pretend she's only six inches off the ground, but she notes something behind her. What's that noise, a security widget? Oh no, no, and it looks like she falls with the gizmo too. So then we're back at Lincoln Plaza. We've got this torrential downpour, uh, which is the effect of uh, Storm's powers. Avalanche uh, snuck up on from behind by Nightcrawler, who's free, who directs Avalanche's powers towards the blob. And Wolverine uh, arrives just in time to get his fist right under the blob's jaw and chin. And basically, I love this panel, want to call it quits. Either way is fine with me. So the blob knows he's beaten and he gives up with a big grin on his face. So what's he grinning for? Well, it turns out that uh, the Brotherhood weren't inter interested in Kitty or her rusky smooch, um, even though get, uh, nailing him was icing on the cake. It was all a diversion, right? He says, go ahead, send us back to prison. We've been there before, we'll bust out but you poor slobs are gonna to have to find yourselves a new teacher or a way to raise the old one from the dead. So these pages I'm pretty sure are inked by Brett Breeding to the end of the issue. And uh, this is a, um, a screen tone that um, he's using um, on many of these pages for the nighttime setting. And then we're back at the X-Mansion. So what's happening here? So Professor X still recovering from the sonic scan sweating there and then rogue arrives with some herb tea now she went to fetch aspirin so interesting that and then the professor's thinking to himself about the uh about how there is a telepathic pattern that feels familiar to him it was months ago in washington mystique used it to inhibit my side probe so she could get close enough to me too and then from under the tray and the towel uh emerges this gun and then the professor moves just in time and he's shot in the side. And the thought here, and it is of course Mystique, she thinks incredible at the very last instant, he sensed my attack despite my sonic scrambler. He was able to make me shift my aim so that a shot meant to kill, only wounded him. He's unconscious now though, quite helpless. And then of course the real rogue arrives. This is a bit amusing. She says, professor, I heard a shot and a scream, Christmas. Okay, that tells you the era that this uh, comic is from. And um, so who is her double? It's her mother, her foster mother, that is Mystique. And Rogue asks the question, I don't get it. Why are you doing this? So Mystique is of the opinion that Rogue couldn't possibly have voluntarily joined the X-Men. And she says that she's doing it all for you, of course. Did you think I was going to let Xavier steal my daughter and get away with it? And Rogue explains, he didn't kidnap me. Whatever gave you that idea? I thought you understood, Mystique. I came of my own free will. And Mystique responds, how would you know, Rogue? With his accursed mental powers, Xavier could make you believe or do anything. And she says, I won't let you kill him. It's wrong. You're wrong. And Mystique tells her to stand aside. So how, oh, by the way, here we've got a little um, caricature of Anne Nocenti here, who would very shortly become editor of Uncanny X-Men. So there you go. And then back to this interview between Mystique and Rogue, where Rogue really explains that um, she hasn't been uh, brainwashed, uh, that uh, she joined the X-Men. She went to Professor X because her power is out of control. She explains, I can't touch you, can't touch anyone because the slightest physical contact transfers that person's memories and abilities to me. I can't handle it anymore. It's driving me crazy. Mystique, I spent months trying to kill Dazzler. I hated her because she was a mutant with all the things I could never have. She had lovers, she had friends. Xavier's my last resort. If you truly love me, if you want what's best for me, you'll respect my decision and let me stay. And when it's over, Mystique asks, when you have to choose between X-Men and Brotherhood, him and me, what then? 
And Rogue responds, at least I'll have a choice. More than I've got now. And um, she tells Mystique, I want to be normal. If nothing else, I want a chance. Is that so much to ask? And she believes that that chance to be normal is something that only Professor X can help her with. So then some time passes and Mystique holographically projects to the Lincoln Center and addresses the X-Men that she has a simple proposition, her colleague's freedom, for what? For their mentor's life. So nice color hold here as well uh, for the holographic projection of Mystique. So Nightcrawler asks the obvious question, how do we know he isn't already dead? And Storm responds, what alternative have we Nightcrawler? We must trust her. And so Storm agrees to Mystique's conditions and the Brotherhood walk away, but not without the blob gloating that the night wasn't a total bust. We still nailed Colossus. So how is Colossus? How is he doing? And what about that gizmo that Kitty uh, took from Reed Richards lab? What's happened to her? What's happened to the gizmo? And I like this last panel with Wolverine warning the blob. A word to the wise blob, get used to looking over your shoulder because sooner or later I'll be there. Don't expect to see much after that. That's pretty, pretty uh, tough, tough guy talk from Wolverine um, and really enjoy that. So then Destiny uh, has a warning for the X-Men about Kitty Pride um, and the Baxter building and that in her mind she sees the ultimate darkness fear suddenly silenced oblivion and then there's a report on a police radio all units vicinity of midtown east ambulance and motor patrols plus field supervisor respond to the baxter building and here's someone on the ground at the baxter building the report continues or the call continues investigative or sorry investigate reports of a jumper Description as follows, Caucasian female, age indeterminate, but young, probable fatality. And this looks like Kitty Pride, yes? But don't forget what was Mask and Callisto and Sunder up to with that dead woman's body in the alley on the Lower East Side earlier in the issue. Last caption, what happened to Kitty? Well, we'll have to read the next issue to find out. Letters page here answered by Angel. And also interesting to note for uh, people who know their comics, one of the letters here by Colleen Doran, who would go on to uh, create the comic book series, A Distant Soil, and also do some issues of Neil Gaiman's uh, Sandman as well. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 178. If you did, please like the video on YouTube, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned for more content like this.